Adam the Enrager. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. The choice we've got a mandate to get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling a friend. We love that about you. Chris Max Paz over there. Mike Fanoia is over here. Mike's a stand up comedian. Mike's got a special out. Uh, Mike uh, opened for me in Portland a few years back. Also a writer on uh, Impractical Jokers and much more. Good yeah. to see you, Mike. Great to see you. The special will be out. It's coming out this Thursday. That's right. Got a special that will be out this Thursday. And you can find it on YouTube. Yeah, it's called see. Don't yeah. Let Me Down. There you go. Mike's a very funny stand-up, travels, opens, closes, middles, and uh, <laughs> also, <laughs> yeah, also uh, has some kind of interesting life story. I remember uh, we were talking about COVID and your wife's a nurse and you're oh, camping God. out in the backyard. <laughs> That's right. And yeah. um, Seems like decades ago. I know, which is probably probably a good thing. Also uh, follows the band Fish. Uh, Seen uh, many a Fish concert, maybe 250 last count. I think something around there, yeah. Maybe a little lower. I can't remember. Uh, they're, they're quite the <laughs> phenomenon because, you know, the Grateful Dead, people sort of go, well, Fish sort of maybe modeled itself off the Grateful Dead. But the Grateful Dead had quite a few hits and got quite a bit of airplay. Yeah. There were many Grateful Dead songs you could hear and, and through the decades. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, Truckin', Touch of Grey, a lot of them, yeah. Yeah. And they, then, then Hell in a Basket came out and then they, they had consistent presence. Right. Yeah. Beyond just their fans. Mike's Correct. wearing a Grateful Dead shirt right now. Right. <laughs> but Fish has seemed to have done it minus that part. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think they maybe have had one song that's ever been on the radio, maybe one or two, and it's that 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. DJ that maybe right. gets to pick a song or two that he likes. Right. And uh, yeah, it's it's they they did it all without it, but they somehow mastered this fear of missing out thing, where you know they play these songs that you have to go to every show because you may miss that gem. And that's yes. that weird. That's my geeky. You know, magic cards or Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, oh, they're or... going to play side one of Quadrophenia. Yeah. And you didn't see that the last 249 times <laughs> and then, you and went. Then your, and then your jerk friend that was there is like, should have been there, man. Oh, yeah. And it's always the best. <laughs> it's <laughs> always the best. The, it, like, that's, I had that with parties. I had that with anything I wasn't at. Right. It's Just the, the best. <laughs> Women I've slept with. But before me, they slept with other guys, and it was always the best. Yeah, so was, Fish is just capitalizing on FOMO? It yes. Literally. Yeah, it's P-H-O-M-O. <laughs> yeah, with P-H. <laughs> yeah. They, the, the fear of missing out. It's a, that's all it is. And you know, a lot of people who do stand-up that don't get it, I've kind of tried to figure out how to explain it, right? You know when you're doing crowd work and you go, how long have you two been together? Or where did you meet? Or whatever. That's like the chorus and the lyrics. Mm -hmm. And wherever the story goes, that's the improv. That's the jam. You know what I mean? Right. So that's what they do. They do their little setup and they do They kind of do like musical crowd work in a way. Every single show goes differently. They don't play the same. They don't play one song the same way twice. So, but they uh, I, I mean, to me, it feels like the best of all worlds for them. Because oh, yeah. Yeah. they probably don't have to do any press. You know, they probably don't have to go out. You know, if, if you know what it's like when you go play some club and they go, can you come in a day early and do a bunch of radio hits before, you know, local yeah, stuff. Of and course. there's, you know, there's kind of two sides of performing. There's the performing part. And then there's the part where you have to do interviews and tweet and sort of keep up and. Hype yourself right. a little bit. Yeah. So Fish doesn't have to do that. They don't really fall. I and they they can live lives that are sort of beyond the the spotlight. They probably go to the local malls and stores and events and yeah. roll around with anonymity. Yep. Like they they literally you know you want to perform and you want to get paid and then all the other stuff. Getting stopped at the airport and stuff, that, that can be a pain in the ass. And they so dovetail it somehow. They've figured it out. Which is kind of awesome, right? I mean, isn't that the best? Yeah, I, w I would think. I mean, there's 
there's a couple of comedians that kind of do that. There's a couple of bands that kind of do that, but it, it's pretty rare that right. you get to do that. Yeah, you sell out four nights at the garden, <laughs> but then you go eat lunch in the village and no one right. cares. Yeah, you go from the garden to the village. <laughs> it's not that bad, you know? I like it. I don't go to as many as I used to, um, mainly just because, I don't know, I kind of hate big crowds. But uh, conversely, I've been going to a lot of shows that I haven't. I, I feel like kind of I wore blinders as a kid and only went to my concerts, you know? So I have a list of people I want to see before they die. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, Bruce was one of them. Mm-hmm. And I brought my wife to see Bruce at uh, Giant Stadium. The show right before he canceled his tour. Mm-hmm. What a great time. I loved it. it was, yeah. They do that, uh, you know, he plays forever. He's the hardest working guy. Blah, blah, blah. Are you not a fan? No, I am. I, I have him. There's, this, there's a, a group of bands and individuals that I have sort of on a, on a list, which are talented, gifted performers who are a little overrated in certain departments. Like I would never I would never overrate Bruce in the live performance department. I feel like he's the the top of that pyramid. Um some of the songs like that we all love are like a little like gl- glory days and stuff like that are just kind of ditties. There's not much to them like Rosalita, that's a big song. That's a yeah. layered, it's complicated, you know. Yep. They're I the, I think the problem that I have with Bruce is he's he has some good songs, some real good songs, and he's a great performer. And then he has a couple that sound a little dated and aren't very complex or interesting or whatever. And I go, you don't have to worship at the altar of those songs. Sure, I you know you, you yeah. can just go that not as best. Yeah, <laughs> you don't have to go nuts. And I always drives me nuts in Glory Days when he says speedball instead of fastball. Uh, I get that. Yeah, um, that like makes... it's called a fastball. He's a pitcher. <laughs> yeah. there, nobody ever called it a speedball. Yeah, no speedballs when you take cocaine uh, and, and heroin yeah. and, and, and you mix it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> literally like the keyboard killer. You know, right. is a speedball. You know, it's funny. People ask me, they're like, "What'd you think of the Bruce show?" And I'm like, "If he played the last seven songs first, I would have left." Right. You know what I mean? Like there yeah. was stuff that I was like, "Whatever, I don't really care about this." But like you're saying, but it's funny watching Giant Stadium where every other person is like, he's playing this to me. This is yeah, my song. Yeah, there's a and thing. The women hold up their signs. Um, you're Wendy or whoever. I'm trying to think who hopped on. I, I tell you, the one, I got my one, my one beef, Bruce, Bruce beef, Bruce beef, Bruce beef. He should come out with the jerky. <laughs> is when guys do the hop on my bike and your daddy doesn't like me and we're driving to the edge of town, like I, I'm always like, that's a little fucked out. Like, could you write a song where the dad really liked you and you guys got along <laughs> swimmingly and you, you drove something sensible like a Prius or an Accord? You know what her I mean? Da- her it's, dad gives them stock tips. And I, and I live, I'm from Los Angeles. Yeah, I don't know where the edge of town is. I've never, <laughs> I've never been down to the Badlands or the edge of town. Yeah, that. Sometimes I feel it's it's sort of like in the seventies when guys wrote songs about rambling. Yeah. All the time. I was like, are you writing a song about rambling because you ramble or you love rambling or you heard a bunch of other bands writing songs about rambling and you kinda Yeah, jumped, that's a great jumped point. on it. That's so funny. The Almond Brothers and Little Feet and all those Everybody know. had a song about uh, you know, blowing into town making love to your women, mostly underage. They yeah, kind of hit that one harder than they needed to. Absolutely. And right. uh, yeah, your your ninth grade teacher said no, but the love was too strong, you know? <laughs> and then at some point after you had your way with them sexually, you dump them off. I mean, the worst is uh, Chevy Van. I know you got to find that one. He picks this chick up. He throws her in his van. He brings her down to the river. I assume he rapes her, and then he takes her back into town and just drops her off barefoot, like oh. like pushes her out of the. What song is this? Van. Chevy Van. This is eighteen. Was an old maid in the eighties. <laughs> you had to be fifteen or sixteen. Yeah, they were milfs. Yeah, eighteen was a milf. Eighteen at that. was a milf. Kind of true. Yeah, you got married out of high school and right. 
get picked up. You got your graduation. No, they scissors wanted. And... They didn't want milfs. They want milk. People who are actually <laughs> drinking <laughs> milk in junior high. <laughs> I only bang no milk. No more formula. <laughs> That's right. Just milk. Just the box stuff <laughs> that they hand out for free at the junior high. That's my sex demo. <laughs> Somewhere between colostrum and Budweiser. Yeah, oh, I, I don't little... do the chocolate milks. Not my scene. <laughs> not judging. <laughs> not for me. That's all. What was that Just song? Preference. Was it Leonard Skinner? Like, what's your name, little girl? Oh, yeah. What's your there name? There was a, there's Just a million little girl songs. thousand songs about little girls and then it would be fun it would be funny because at some point they would show their hand and go the you know everyone says no but you tell that to my loins and it was like <laughs> yeah they're saying no because yeah. her stepdad sees you're taking a 15 year old out of his house <laughs> yeah. you know that say no to this solo <laughs> you know <Yeah>. right <laughs> yeah it's we, out of control we don't they don't do those songs anymore no that'd be that'd be a fun like com- like compilation you know how they do like remember the 80s right it was just a compilation of like those little girl songs <laughs> just yeah, statutory rape rock. I mean, we put together a. There's a baker's dozen of those. At least those oh songs. Oh my god! Wonder what era that ended. Was that like '90s? Did that end '80s? Because did that make it into the '80s with like the the like warrant and you know like cherry pie and all that? Was that about young girls? That yeah, was taking cherry virginity. pie was probably that. I I they it probably went away in the early '80s because in the early '80s. Then we had punk rock, mm. and they ironically, you know, they weren't singing about underage sex. They were thinking, they're singing about pushing back against the man and, right. and right. Uh, how uh, New York was all right if you like saxophones, which is one of my <laughs> crazy songs. Winger, Winger did She's Only 17 in 89. Right. Okay. But couldn't, you know, only couldn't we 17. just move it to 18? And then, and then so it was. Joe Jackson, um, Elvis Costello, uh, The Pretenders, a lot of that stuff, punk rock, early 80s. And then somehow in the later, mid or later 80s, hair bands were like, hey, how come no one's singing about raping underage girls? It's it's been been a minute. And then they went, you know what? Let's form a group. Let's tease our hair. And let's get back to the basics of rock and roll, right. which is singing about raping underage girls. Yeah. So then it had a resurgence from like, you know, 86 to 90. And then Nirvana and Soundgarden came in and went, no, no, we're going back to yeah. singing about depression, depression. and suicide yeah. and the man. And then they killed everyone's boner. <laughs> So it's a cycle of boner killing. Boner, yeah, yeah. yeah the the ups and downs of. Uh... They they had the the statutory rape rock songs from the like fifties and sixties, but it was more like you're a beautiful, you know, uh, your your uh, Ringo had your your fifth, your sixteen, you're, you're beautiful in your mind, right? Right. That's what I was just. Yeah. But they. But they were talking about sort of wholesome stuff, like we're, we're going to hold hands. Yeah, we're going to go to the soda oh. fountain and, and yeah, and we're getting knee twist. high. <laughs> then we're gonna, I'm going to buy you a float. There's chubby checkers in town. We're yeah. going to watch this concert. It's funny you say that because like that Happy Days American Graffiti kind of era, you almost think like someone's singing it from the perspective of a high school right guy. You yeah, it's like should I ask her to the dance? Like, will you wear my varsity jacket? Yeah, she's gonna. I'm going to pin her, but not pin her down by the side of the lake and <laughs> right. fuck her. I'm going to put like, my <laughs> pin on her lapel, right. and then we'll go steady. Yeah. And, <laughs> and then at some point, she may tragically die. Hey, that happens, yep. you know? If you're, so. you're going to date a car racer, yes, <laughs> it's going to happen every now and then. Yes, that is the story <laughs> of Tell Laura I Love Her. Yep. Remember that? Yep. He won out racing. She yeah. didn't want. You had to go. Tragic. You had to go drag racing. That's right. And then to. at some point, you had to try to beat a train. That's oh. right. That's right. If I was in charge of like high school drag racing in the fifties, it'd be like, can we stop picking highways that run across like perpendicular perpendicular to the train Seriously. tracks? There's plenty of them that just run alongside the train yeah. tracks. Right, right, you know? right, right. We yeah. gotta we gotta go the ones that go over the tracks. That's when kids were doing drugs named like bow and pop and blues and yellows <laughs> and they're just taking handfuls of pills and yeah. just driving as fast Mother's as they could. little helpers. Yeah. Right, absolutely. Them. I love Which that. Which is a Rolling Stone song. That's right. That's uh I love that Commander Cody song, Hot Rod Lincoln. Uh-huh. That's such a fun one. I actually was excited to uh, last night I was driving 
I took a little bit of a you know um, scenic route around LA. Mm-hmm. Went up uh, Mulholland Drive and like Multi View and all that. Mm-hmm. Those switchbacks. That's a lot of fun to drive up there. Yeah, I don't get to do that obviously much living in the city. You know, live, driving around out here. Yeah, you're you're in New York. Yeah, yeah. I wish I planned this out a little different, where I would have driven to San Francisco instead of flown later today. Would mm-hmm. have been nice to take a day and just cruise up the coast. Everybody should do that coast ride to San Francisco once in their life. I, yeah, it is be beautiful. It is uh, spectacular. Yeah. Even when I lived here and I was poor, I would figure out a way to make that that run yeah. every every two or three years. I love driving. I I. I mean, even in the city, even in Manhattan, I'll, t- I'll drive over taking the subways, taking the trains. I want my own smells. I want my own sounds. I want yeah. my own people. In Your my- own schedule. Right. And I don't have to. And even I'd rather sit in an hour of traffic than take a 30 minute disgusting subway ride. You know? Yeah. You know, I'm going to I was just thinking about this. If some people can't handle a road trip, like they're like, oh, driving. It's so tiring. <laughs> like, it's like. Tiring. Oh, I love How, it. Can be tiring, but I think if I was to like wish a few things for like my kids, well, let's just say my son. I would say if you can learn to sleep on your back, the world is your oyster. If you can learn to masturbate standing up, that's a good thing. <laughs> if you can go without lube, that's a the better world is thing. Your tissue. <laughs> the world is your tissue box. And if you kind of dig road trips, everything's good. Because the people, it's almost a genetic aversion to road trips. I go, oh, how long to Phoenix? You're like eight hours. I go, I can't do it. It's like, it's if you if you're into it, if you can do it, then especially if you live in the United States, oh, it's the greatest. And you got a, and you got a decent car, like everyone has now, or rental car. It it opens the whole place up to you. That's it. And anytime I go anywhere where I'm going to be more than like a day or two, or right. if I'm flying into a city and. The hotel's next to the club or whatever, right? Like, you know, you go to D.C. I don't need a car in D.C. Right. But I'll drive to D.C., so I'll have my car. But if I'm, you know, when I'm here, two, three days, I got to get a car. And if I have nothing to do, I'm cruising around. I'm just getting lost, shutting off the GPS and just driving around. I love it. And it, as a young... Picking up barefoot underage chicks, <laughs> taking them down to the river in you your wagon. You ever hear this song? <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, it's just... I, and I love... I mean, <clears throat> that was one of the fun things about fish. I mm. mean, literally, I had a buddy who built a Volkswagen at, like by hand, it, him and a friend. They just built it piece by piece by piece, 67 bus. And we mm. took that out. Went out nice. to like Indiana and Wisconsin <laughs> and all that and just lived in it. Had the pop top, you know? Oh, the pop the top. The pop top nice. and all that. So it was, I love it. And I learned to drive it. It was a four, four, four gears. And four it, on the floor. And you had to say. push down and go underneath first yeah. to yeah. go into reverse. Well, the thing about the VW bus is the stick shift is like three foot long. And it just slops it's all, like a over, all, all over the place. <laughs> yeah. Really you pull it out, shoot lightning from it, push it back in. That's how you get rid of traffic. <laughs> turn turn that guy in front of you into a frog. Yeah. And you never know what gear you're in versus yeah. the short, positive, even the Ferraris have gated where it has its own oh, slot. Yeah. You know, mm. boom. Like you, it's really hard to fuck it up. What What percentage of cars these days even has manual transmission at this point? At this point, none, if you don't order them special for, like, value sake. Okay. So, like, you might be able to order a special Porsche with a six-speed, and that would be, like, a special option. And then you would do that because it would be worth more when you sold it on Bring a Trailer in five years. Okay. Because the, right. the manual stuff in the sports car, but nothing. But I did have a, a moment of, like, you know, most of being a dad's a horrible disappointment, but every once in a while you get the, oh, really? Oh, okay. My daughter said to me out of the blue the other day, she goes, I want to learn how to drive a stick. Wow. And I was like, you're, you've come to the right place. Why? Um, I don't know. I, 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 I don't. I, <laughs> Just I think, in case she's barefoot in a I, dusty yeah, town and right. has to get away quick. What is the reason? There has <laughs> to be something I'm not thinking of. You know, once in a while, something retro will circle back with the kids. And, you know, I told her, look, you're going to be the only person you know who can drive a stick. Yeah. And I came up, I won't bore everyone with the details, but I came up with a technique to teach anyone to drive a stick in like under 
eight minutes. No kidding. Yes, it's foolproof. Oh, I would love to hear it. Well, uh, without going over something I've been over on the show before, oh, it's uh, all about the clutch. <coughs> It's all about the clutch. Everyone lets the clutch out. It starts bucking. Mm -hmm. They panic a little and the car stalls. Right. That That's how it works. Um, the whole deal is when you let the clutch out, you got to start giving it gas. Right. Uh, if it starts bucking or whatever, you just have to press the clutch in. That's all. You press the clutch in and you're back to neutral. Right. You're back to zero. And you're coasting forward. Because when you start letting the clutch out and give it a little gas, you start moving forward, then it starts bucking, and then it stalls. But if you press the clutch in, you'll be coasting forward. And then if you let the clutch out again, you're already moving forward a little, and you start giving a little more gas, and you can do it. So yeah. all you have to do is come up with a word for you would be fish. The safe word? <laughs> yeah, safe yeah. word. Yeah. And I would sit in the passenger seat, and as you start letting out the clutch, start bucking, I yell, fish! And you push the clutch in. I'd go, where? Take both feet <laughs> <off> the... <laughs> Grab some mushrooms from the console and shove it in your face. <laughs> this trigger word, you didn't realize. <laughs> yeah, if you, you establish a word with everyone. I love that. You sit while the car isn't even running. Yeah. And you just sit there, and you just go, let's test this out. And you go, fish! And they push the clutch in. You go, all right, let it out, let it out. Fish, and they push it in again. Do that five times, then start. They won't stall the car. And the whole thing is to start. Once you're once you're running, once you're moving, then you're just steering pretty much, and that's no big deal. Once you're, it's the start, the bucking, the panic, and the stall. Right. Yep. That's you're that's right. where people can't get past. The panic is, the, and that the panic's the biggest one. That's right. Because the minute you start to feel that jerking, you start to get nervous about the person behind you and the right. person, for, you know? Right. Am and I going to just stall out you here? You do everything but push the clutch back in, which would alleviate the problem immediately. Right. But you don't do it. You start messing with the gas and the brake, and then you stall. I remember my grandfather telling me early on, he goes, you got to learn how to drive standard so you can always drive no matter what. Like if you're... Right. If you're, you know, someone's hammered, someone's right. whatever, like you have to mm -hmm. steal a car and get away from something, you can yes. always drive stick. And, and and I love it and I miss it. Even in the city, I love driving standard. I don't know. I mean, it's just, you feel more in it. Yeah, I feel you're less more engaged. Like, yeah, just less distracted. And Your, uh, your dog's doing commercial work now? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Your, your dog's making you money? My dog's got a better career than I do right now. Wow. Yeah. This stings because I'm boarding my dog right now. You mean like? At a boarding facility. Where? As we speak? As we speak. Mine too. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, she's not in like, you know, sh she still has to be a normal dog. She still has to do her homework. <laughs> Keeps her grounded. <laughs> she yeah, still yeah. has to do her chores. I was backstage at the Capitol Theater doing a show with Joe Gatto and, uh, just got to talking. Someone knew my wife and her brother from uh, growing up. I pull out my phone and my dog is my screensaver. Mm -hmm. And she goes, oh my God, I'm a pet agent. Would you ever want your <laughs> dog to be in? Do you have any other pictures? And I'm like, this is unbelievable. <laughs> wow. I'm a pet agent. A pet agent. <laughs> so I start showing pictures. My dog's beautiful. And uh, what is, what is <laughs> the dog? Charlie is, she's a yellow lab pit, a little bit of beagle, big old ears, mm. gorgeous face. Mm -hmm. Uh, Great tits, <laughs> and uh, she um, and she. I uh, I could say that, you know. Yeah, She's yeah, mine. you can say yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. Um. I so say I I waited and waited. Nothing. We go do this audition. She kills it. They go, hey, we put her in for a commercial. It's between. Wait, what's her. the audition? Oh, uh, dude, what's it was hilarious. Actually, it was at a, a big mansion in White Plains, and turns out the woman who started this agency was like the handler and the vet for the Captain Kangaroo show. Uh huh. So I guess there used to be, I don't remember that show, where there used to be like tons of animals on it and stuff. I don't remember it very well. I remember Captain Kangaroo a little bit. I remember Hobo Kelly. <laughs> and I remember Sheriff John back Different when time. homeless people were hobos. <laughs> Hobo. Yeah. I kind of love that. Term. Yeah. <laughs> That's the original White Snake version. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's pictures of uh, her and. Dolly Parton and an eagle, her and Johnny Carson and a python, her mm -hmm. and Nixon and a, you know, giraffe, whatever, all these famous people. And <laughs> she brings my dog through this little, you know, sit, paw, this, that. She gets her into like some weird voodoo, like dog whisper trance where my dog now has her paws crossed wow. and her head tipped. Wow. And she goes, Mike, out of the room, out of the room. And we back out of the room and my dog's just... And I'm like, the fuck you do? What'd you do to my dog? Dog's you know? never done this. No. And she goes, free. And she comes running like nothing ever happened. And I'm like, damn, this is incredible. Unreal. So 
Long, a couple of months later, she texts me, goes, hey, she's in the running for a commercial, but it's her and one other dog. And don't take it personal, but this other dog's kind of like the dog. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm like, all right, I won't tell her. But then she calls me. She goes, congratulations, she got the gig. So we had to go do a, uh, it was uh, right over the, like, Nyack, New York, like right mm-hmm. over the bridge. And it's this big warehouse area, green screen. It's commercial where basically, like, someone takes the medicine and it works. And now right. he's going to walk his dog that apparently right. maybe he's been neglecting his whole right. time. <laughs> so this poor dog hasn't been walked in. But the green screen was, like, a living room. And then it turns immediately into a park. And that's mm-hmm. the part of the commercial where it's, like, this may cause anal bleeding right. and, you know, yeah, right. all the side dysentery effects. and whatever. So the dog is sitting at the couch. They yell action. There's a trainer at the other end, and she's like, come here, Charlie, come here, you want a treat? And my dog just prances perfectly the first time, boom, nailed it. And I'm like a pageant mom. Like, I'm like yeah. in the back, like, <laughs> that's my girl, right? I'm like elbowing PAs and stuff, and I'm like, that's my baby. So they bring in another guy to do it, like another, like a stand-in, and he's yanking the dog's leash a little bit, mm-hmm. and it started to kind of piss me off. Mm-hmm. So I'm just standing in a little video village, and I'm like, I'm just going to let this go, and one more time he kind of just pulled and he wasn't communicating good with the dog. So I just go cut, cut. And I yelled cut. <laughs> and the director turns to me and he goes, you don't, you don't yell cut. He goes, that's not what you do. And I'm like, can I show him how to walk my dog? I'm like, I'll save us all a ton of time. So I go in, I grab the leash, like kind of angrily. And I'm like, you all you gotta do is flick your wrist. You don't need to pull the dog. Just mm-hmm. guide her a little bit. I go, watch, I'll do it. And I sit down and I'm like, and they're like, action. They kind of like humored yeah. me. And I did the commercial. I walked it. It was perfect. And the guy's like, that was great. And I'm like, if you guys want, I can do the commercial. Yeah, like, yeah. I'm in show business, you know? And they're like, they sent a PA over. And they're like, maybe we can show you where Crafty is. And oh, they yeah. kind of <laughs> walked Perhaps me out. be more comfortable and with then, some and they kind of like walked, trail mix. <laughs> <laughs> and they walked me out. And they were like, yeah, just hang here. We'll, we'll be done shortly. Yeah. And they kind of like nicely was like, <laughs> get the hell out of here. <laughs> And I realized I'd be the dad that would like go viral for like fighting an umpire probably or something like that. Oh, you know, I can't just remind me of a long lost dog set story that I have that kind of covers two things. And one is the dog. And then the other is the people who pass on. I'm very obsessed with people pass on erroneous information where they just go, oh, no, that guy. No, he's a, you know. All right, the worst is like, oh, he's pissed off. And that dude's pissed off. And then you talk to him and go, I'm sorry, is there a problem? And they go, I don't know. What? No. Why? I'm not pissed. No, I didn't say anyone I was mad. Like the fucking Those, fire starter. Sure, the conduit that no one yes, asked for. The yeah. conduit that nobody asked for. And, and then the weird, like, they know nothing. But yet knowing nothing. Now, they always go at the end, they go, I didn't know. And they go, yeah, but why is everything negative? Like, sure. why is everything a fire yeah, starter? That's right? a great point. We were uh, shooting. I did a movie called Road Hard and we we're shooting a movie, we were shooting a scene on a fake airplane where the woman next to me on this flight had a dog on her lap. And so that was a scene we were going to shoot. And. They had the crafty set up, Mm -hmm. and somebody set up a lox and bagel table, (laughs) which which is a pretty awesome it's endeavor from a a food policy. I I love a lox and bagel. Sure. And so there was a guy on the set, and I don't know who he was. This is before we shot the scene with the dog, and he was holding his dog, and it was like a kind of long hair, scroungy kind of medium sized dog. He was holding the dog under one arm, standing at the locks table, trying to, with like one hand, put together the tomato and the onion <laughs> and the cream cheese and the locks, right? Sure. And I'm just watching this guy and his dog's kind of up there. And I'm thinking, okay, could you have a worse environment for a long haired dog? It is open cream cheese. It is wheels of tomato. It's cut up tomato. Right. It is lox and his bagel. Like lox would attract hair from across the room. It would <laughs> damp it, it, tomatoes. It's gonna, like a tractor like, beam. Like yeah. if that dog fly paper. And and then there's a big pile of cream cheese. Yep. And he's holding his dog up. I I I have no fucking idea where these people come from. Like nah. first off, I don't know why your dog is here. <laughs> but secondly, put your dog on the floor and then make yourself yep. a, a lox and cream cheese bagel. But he's holding it. So I'm across the set, and I just yell. I just go, hey! And the guy, like, looks. I go, 
put your goddamn dog down. And he's like, whoa, whoa okay. And like these people are like, where's this coming from? Well, where it's coming from is you're holding this remnant of shag carpet that's filthy above this thing yep. that's open locks. I'm with you 100%. And everything else, like, we're all going to use it, but you were holding your fucking dog. And by the way, it doesn't help you. You're trying to do this thing with, like, one hand. Yeah, right? yeah. So I yell, get your goddamn dog, put it on the ground. And then he's like, okay. And then he, he does it. And then somebody works on the set, like, comes up and goes... That's the dog wrangler. That's the guy we have to work with. His dog's going to be sitting next to you on this airplane. And I'm like, oh, fuck. Because <laughs> we're going to need him. We're going to yeah. need his dog. He's going to have to be there sort of just behind the camera doing stuff with his dog and stuff. And I just told him to put his fucking dog on the floor and call him an asshole. Right? And so I'm like, that's the guy? That's that's the dog, huh? Yeah, that's the dog. And I'm like, oh, fuck. Uh, uh, you got to apologize. Not the dog. Different dog. Oh, it was a different, different dog. dog. Just a person coming to me and feeding me a bunch of fucking erroneous information so they could ruin my fucking locks and bagel. The conduit that nobody the needs. The conduit that nobody needs. Just, oh, did you hear this? Oh, what about that? Or did you know? Or that person's pissed or whatever. Yeah. It's like, fuck you. And all it does is just reinforce that critic that we already have, right? We got that post game right. show going on. <laughs> right. And then it's boop, 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 boop. And by the way, they could, they don't know. Right. That's the thing. It's not like I talked to the person. And he said, I'm the dog. They don't know. No, they don't have any idea. And they never huh? fucking couch it. They never go, oh, I hope that's not the dog. No, that's the dog. How much time in between you yelling, put the dog down, and conduit no one needed coming <laughs> over and telling you this? Did he watched it instantaneously. Yeah, because I yelled it across of the, course. Yeah. the, the room, and, I've and done... then he had to come over. Do I call that? I, have a, I think I have a counter... Or whatever, an alter ego called the low risk vigilante, mm -hmm. where I can't watch someone park over two handicapped spots, mm -hmm. and I, I got to go, oh, oh, do right. the right thing, right? And then they move their car because they're like, is this guy uh, playing close, close <laughs> right, cop or right. whatever? You, you know, you got to have a little of that. <laughs> <laughs> but I do that quite a bit, where I'll just snap, and then I'm like, oh shit, I snapped on my neighbor, my, my old neighbors, for, right when my wife and I first lived in the suburbs. Nicest people in the world. Mm -hmm. And they had their kids were so kind and they would like do that shaving their head for St. Baldrick's Day and all oh, like wow. just, like just salt of the earth. Amazing people. Literally the neighbors you would like die for. These people were great. I come home from a show, been was drinking a bit. They had their friends, the kids had their friends over and they were in the pool and it was like three in the morning, mm -hmm. screaming at the top of their lungs. <laughs> having an amazing time, just kids having a memorable summer moment. <laughs> mm -hmm. I can't sleep. I'm sobering up, whatever. I go out on the back deck. I go, oh, now it's dead silent on a cul-de-sac. <laughs> oh, no. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> the minute the words left my mouth, I'm like, no, 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 no. They're, they're still going to be here when the sun comes up. What, yeah. am I, what did I just do? Oh. And I bet the, the kids are like, maybe we should go inside. And they just went in the house and I was like, oh my God, I just ruined... These people, I mean, like, they could have kicked me in the face and in the dick a hundred times, and it, it would have the good that they did. <laughs> and I'm and I'm like, I, I had to. I called my wife at work. She was working overnight in the hospital, and I'm like, I did a dumb thing. I'm like, I yelled at the neighbors' kids, and I and she came home, and I was like, sitting, like I was going tent. through it because I'm I I'm not that guy, right? But at the moment, I was, yeah. And I was like, I went over and knocked on the door in the morning. I <laughs> wow. didn't sleep. I didn't wow. sleep. Good for you. And I was like hung over and feeling like shit. And I went over and I'm like, I don't even know. I don't even know what to say. Like, I'm so sorry. Like, I'm sick. I'm not feeling well. I started just going through all these. And then I stopped myself and I'm like, no, no, I, I was just an asshole. And I really right. want to make it up to you guys. And I bought them like a couple hundred dollars in like movie coupons. <laughs> I got a card and wrote like apology. We ended up moving. We moved. We sold because the house. Because of the incident. I could never let that no, go. No, it's haunted yeah. now. It's just this, you it's were tainted. that guy, yeah. you know? And uh, it just, it, it, but <laughs> I, you know what though? I see that and I go, don't snap. Don't snap. Don't be that guy anymore, you know? Well, maybe I was that guy with the dog. No, but I'm with you. I do. Good. No. <laughs> Fucking locks. Locks yeah. and tomatoes. Open locks and open tomatoes. I, and listen. Don't tickets for that. Guy. And I'm a dog owner that I respect other people. I don't do that bullshit where you're never going to get slobbered on by my dog. You're yes. never oh, going to no. get furry. Whatever. Like, I keep my dog. I go, come on, over here. There's people that are just like, 
it's my dog, so it's the world's dog. Yeah. Fuck that. I hate that. And how yes. come so many people's dogs are wet? My dog's dry <laughs> as a bone. Why are, why do I touch a dog? And I'm like, what the fuck? Like yeah. I, slimy. In the in this department, the other story that uh, pops in my head that just drove me nuts, which is um we had a guy who used to work here and he was yeah, a little inaccurate and he was so the back story is is I won the Toyota Grand Prix <laughs> as a celebrity. Is this the same guy? He, I think it's the same guy because okay. I think he worked on. He did. I remember. He he, 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 he was just full of chick rage oh. and and inaccurate information. And also, is this conduit that no one wants? Yes, okay. conduit right. that no one wants because I think they know what they're doing. Of course, they know what they're doing. So <laughs> he came up to me. Uh, no, so. I win the Toyota Grand Prix. And then the next year I come back and I win in the uh, pro division. If you win the celebrity division, they let you run in the pro division, but no one wins the pro division because yeah, now you're running in the year. pro division yeah, with sure. professional indie drivers and then you're not going to win. Right. But I somehow managed to win both. So I was like the only guy or one one of the few guys in the 50-year history that won both the celebrity and then I won the pro, right? Right. And then the guy who won... In the celebrity division, who's a friend of mine, Rutledge Wood, super sweet guy, he then next year would drive in the pro division. Okay. But I was like, I don't want him to win the pro division because then it just happened back to back. Right. And then my accomplishment is not that great. <laughs> and I like the guy a lot. But the pro division is stacked with professional indie drivers, and there's no way he's going to win. Sure. He's, no, a, he's, 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 he's a good enough driver. He's not good enough to beat these guys. You like him where he is. Right. Yeah. That's right. Hey, look, he won. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> taking that away from him. Yeah, yeah. And we got uh, nothing wrong with a little shot in front. Yeah, that's, that's me and Rutledge Wood after right. I won the pro, and then he came in second, and or he came in won the celebrity division. And so then the next year, we had one of our guys down at the track, and mm -hmm. I don't know, it was before the internet was humming or something, but I knew that <laughs> the race ended or something. And I called him and I was like, who won the pro division? And he's like, Rutledge Wood. Uh. And I'm like, oh. And then I was like, God damn, he had some super fast professional indie guys in his class. Like, how'd he beat those guys? And I was like, okay, all right. And I like hung up the phone and I was like, Fuck. Yep. <laughs> then I was like, Time's over. Well, I like Rutledge, but shit, man, I didn't even have a rain. You know, it happened the very next year. And then right. I started like looking it up. I went online. I waited for data sheets to come out and stuff. It's like, he didn't come in first. He probably it got, he came, I don't know if he came in last, but he didn't come in first. And Ridiculous. I was like, Where did you get that information? And it's like, I don't know. I was wrong. It's like, <laughs> they have a Jumbotron. <laughs> you know what I mean? They have race coordinators. They're like, there's no way you could have thought that. Just like you didn't think the dog, you <laughs> right. didn't know either one of these things. You knew it would be the worst for me what? emotionally, but you didn't know. That's what, yeah. a, what, what, a <laughs> what is that? Yeah. What, what is that? Because people go, they say to me all the time, they go, I thought, and I'm like, how did you think a thing that didn't and, happen? And and they speak with impunity. Like, oh, yeah. Of course. No, Such no, conviction that, that why would you not believe that? And you're there. Right. You're at the event. And if yeah. you and if you have that, if you don't have that dent in your psyche like they do, you go, well, why would they lie about that? Or why? Right. Well, no, you go, I would never dream of saying something. <laughs> right. I might couch it with, I don't know. I don't or know. Or I got to check. Or that might be, but I need to verify. Nope. They nope. just. They just know, just They're, like just yeah. like people who know. I just got in the discussion. It's like Liza Minnelli. I was just talking to someone. It's like I said, Liza Minnelli's alive, right? No, she's dead. I go, she's dead. Yeah, she's dead. But she's alive. I I didn't hear about it. No, she's dead. She's dead. Final I like, answer. That, I, that, final answer. She's dead. I go, why? Well, I thought I would have heard about that. I mean, yeah. I know she don't. go look it up on the phone. I'm like she's alive. <laughs> I'm like, how do you know stuff that hasn't? How do you know it is what I'm I saying. Know. You I know. know it with impunity. And it's funny if you practice the opposite where like there's such a freedom and liberation to going, I don't know. Like if you literally say like you could forget everything. Uh, you don't have to remember anything. If you I, go, love saying I don't I don't know. I don't know it's the best. <laughs> it's I don't know if it's an insecurity. I don't it's know what it be. is. I say all the time you know, let me check, or I'm not sure, or maybe, you, or I'm, I can't remember, or something. You know, I did sales before I did comedy, right? And it was just a 
there was a I, I dated a girl. Her dad was like ridiculously successful in like printer sales and stuff, right? And I didn't know what I was doing with my life. And I'm like, why don't I get into sales? And you watch these <laughs> sales guys that literally it was almost like cat's eye like you'd get like electrocuted if you said i don't know so you right. had to do these circle back and deep right. dive and right. then, sure. then put a pin in it Check and all with this, my manager all this bullshit right and there was one brilliant sales guy from queens older guy never followed any of the corporate <laughs> structure he would just go i don't know i don't have any idea. he said even if he knew the answer he would use i don't know as almost kind of like a defense mechanism to like break down that wall that Let me get on people's arms would uncross. Yeah. Right. And yeah. it's like, oh, this is an everyman talking to me. It's not some dude in a men's warehouse suit just lying to get commission. <laughs> He'd go, I don't know, but let me check with my systems, whatever, and I'll get back to you. Would you be willing to do business with us if yeah. that now he's was a friend. The, right. And he would do that kind of, you know, the snake oil trick where he would he but he used I don't know as a as the opposite thing. It's huh. always an acceptable answer to it's me. It's great. It's yeah. great, because then it ends the goddamn conversation, too. Nobody wants to talk to someone who doesn't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to get rid of people, you just go, I don't know. <laughs> All right. I do know we got some news to do, so we'll take a quick break. Back with Mike, and we'll do some news right after this. All right. Simply safe. Well, there's no wrong way to protect your home, but this fall, there's an especially good way to protect your home. That's right. It's a good time with Simply Safe. Get up to 50% off a brand new Simply Safe home security system. Best home security system of 2023. That's right. U.S. News and World Report, and that about covers the globe, says Simply Safe is the best. I know because I use it. It's compact, it's ergonomic, it, batteries last up to 10 years. Easy. We all use it here. 24-7 professional monitoring under a buck a day. Half the cost of traditional home security. They got a money back guarantee. 60 days risk-free. If you want to try it out and you don't love it, you can return your system for a full refund. And for a limited time, save 50% on any new system with the Fast Protect plan. Visit simplysafe.com. That's simplysafe.com slash Adam. Two eyes, simplysafe.com slash Adam. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Let me tell you about Angie, homeowners. You know, it's a lot of work to own a home, whether it's uh, everyday maintenance, repairs, or dream projects. It can be hard to even know where to start. All you need is Angie. Your home for everything home. Find a skilled local pro who will deliver quality and experience. Over 20 years of home service experience. Bring them your project online or with the Angie app. Answer a few questions and Angie handles the rest. Look, you're busy. You don't have time to do all this stuff. Let Angie handle it. Take care of just about any home project in just a few taps. Download the free Angie mobile app today or visit online. Visit Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I dot com. A-N-G-I dot com. That's Angie. Let them do all the heavy lifting. Some black folks hate all white people. Some white folks hate all black people. I don't understand that at all. Like, you can't let a couple bad eggs ruin the whole dozen, you know? Like, I've had three girlfriends cheat on me. I'm not blowing dudes now, you know? Like, you gotta <laughs> Cracking eggs. <laughs> One thing that does annoy the shit out of me is I don't like when people go on Facebook and change their profile picture to a rainbow and then call it supporting their gay friends. That's not supporting anybody. That's fucking lazy bullshit. You're on a website for Christ's sake. There's nothing. I got a gay friend, he's one of my best friends. You wanna know I supported him? I bought him an ice pack for his asshole. That's how I supported him. <laughs> That's right. Mike Fenoya is on the Adam Carolla Show. Mike's got a comedy special. It's coming out on YouTube this Thursday as you hear this. It's called Don't Let Me Down. And the website, Mike Fenoya, F-I-N-O-I-A dot com is where you go. All right, we'll do a little news yeah. before Cedric the Entertainer comes so we're, in. We're talking about music, and this is a weird sentence to say, but there have been two new releases. Um, 
recently by the Rolling Stones and the Beatles. Mm. So we'll we'll start we'll start with the Rolling Stones. So they just they just have a new record out, Hackney Diamonds. It's their first uh, record I think since 2005. Hackney and Diamonds. Hackney. Hackney. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Keith Richards is noted for doing an in- interview with the Independent. He's 79 years old, and he was just talking about how. Um, he prefers the old school way of recording a band in a room, and that's the only legitimate way to get the job done. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he started talking about modern music, and this is the quote that everyone's talking about: "The only way to cut a band is to put the boys in a room and play, and look at each other, uh, and look in each other's eyeballs. Don't get me going on modern day music. Push button drums and everything synthesized. Digital recording is a one way toilet." Yeah. Are well, they sure almost all toilets said? are yeah, one that's way. Yeah, that's what I was like. What do you mean by one way <laughs> toilet? <laughs> yeah. Also, as a guy who knows something about plumbing and 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 Hamas <laughs> in the Palestine region, I'm mean, hearing all these news all the times. So all the uh, bleeding hearts on CNN are like, they've shut their water off in Gaza. Now they're drinking from the toilet. It's like uh, when you shut the water off, you get one flush. It doesn't keep. It doesn't come back. It's it's not like an animatronic dog bowl. It It doesn't keep (laughs) resetting. So (laughs) anyone who's drinking from the toilet can only do it for a very limited amount of time. So (laughs) thank you, dumb bitch on CNN. Like they have to drink from the toilet now, which uh, which I'm fine with. I'm just saying you got one flush, and if you go down, turn the angle stop off on the toilet, flush it once. I just happened. I just had this. I had a plumber over at the house. I, uh, he shut the water like mid deuce and the one flush wasn't going to do it. No, no. Yeah. And I had to, I had to leave and the toilet and the water wasn't coming back on till 5 PM kind of thing. But I can tell you, you can't drink from the toilet if the water shut off (laughs) or you can, but you can do it once. Also, I mean, is that, it's hard to direct quote Keith Richard. You ever hear him talk? Yeah. Well, how do they know those are the words he said? It's, he could have said true. new Good music point. is the greatest. <laughs> All you hear with him is like, really fragged it, brown it, frowned it. Yeah. Hardly boom. Like, listening to him talk is like, that's white noise to me. Like, that's like a good like meditation act. How did that ban? I was thinking about, well, maybe The Who and, um, and the Rolling Stones. How do you have a band where you guys make it 55 years and not one of you gets fat? <laughs> There's always one That's fat impressive. guy That's in so a band. True. One yeah. guy, you know, one Randy Bachman lets himself go. Bonham from Bo- got a little bit like beer fat There's, before he died. A little. There's yeah. like always You're right, one dude because it's fucking impossible to pass through your 60s as a dude yeah. and not just your metabolism slows down. These guys aren't fitness experts you know <laughs> they're fucking fucking and eating shit food on the road and stuff they're used to yeah doing they're not down at the gym you know at the no. hotel before they have to hit the stage not a one of them so impressive and not a one of them not only did none of them get fat they just they didn't put on six pounds yeah. like when you watch the greatest nfl players you know Keyshawn johnson or any of these guys and then you see him in the booth now. It's like, oh, the guy's put on a couple of pounds. You're in a you sport know. fit suit. Yeah, like <laughs> you you just as a I'm telling you as a middle aged man, it is hard to keep the weight off. Absolutely. When you, you go, you, you think you're doing something different, you're not doing something different. You you eat less. You can eat less and work out more. Right. And from the age age thirty two to age fifty eight, you will put some weight on. Of course, where there's nothing you can do about it when the metabolism starts to just slow down. First off, there's not a double chin between the fucking <laughs> four of these guys. The four of them. They are not one little turkey gobbler. Mean. You know, even Biden had to have his taken care of a few years ago. Like it's just. What happens when you get older? You know, it, how did all we need to study or avoid it on a diet of indiscriminate sex, cocaine and just fucking starburst and, and yeah. traveling like, how, and, and booze. And, you know, from being I mean, like, it's not like when you get to that certain level too. everything you want is at your disposal backstage. Yes. It's not like you're starving. It's not like no, your bread line has Anything, a beef you know, serving <laughs> cart. A guy with yeah. a big hat, you know, <laughs> Michelin rating Literally. medallion. And hanging around right. his neck, you know what I mean? I they killed the fattest kid in everyone. town for you to eat that day. It's so true. You know who I did see that game? And it's funny, you're right, because this era 
is 100% like that, like you said. But then there's like, I, I saw Vince Neil gained, got a little pudgy, right? And then Axl Rose, I think, did. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Everybody has somebody the, who makes the move, who breaks out. You got it, yes. If not, the whole band. Like, there's whole bands. Like, I don't know if BTO is that way or something. Never find, but everyone just sort of, you get bigger when you get older. Who, who was the guy? Was it Mountain or Canned Heat? Wasn't there, like, one guy in, the in like, the old days that was I'm just a... going to the country. <laughs> that guy. He was I, a big fella. They're big... Dudes, I, I, I'm just saying nobody. <laughs> no, I know. Yeah. Not a one. Um, it would be hilarious. They were all 80 pounds, but Mick Jagger was like du- deuce and a half. Up. This should be the Rolling Stones' greatest accomplishment. They've really defied well, all statistics. You need to study them. Like their music? No, not their metabolism. <laughs> their metabolism. Like, is it about, is it a proximity thing? Right. Is, I mean, where were they from? We What's in the water yeah, there? Liverpool, like weird. Yeah, like what chemical... <laughs> happened during the war there that kept weight off of them because I want it. Who doesn't gain an ounce from 19 <laughs> to 79? Keith and Mick and Ronnie, I guess, apparently. And Ringo and uh, Paul McCartney. McCartney looks incredible. Yeah. But it's, it's all, but... there's something going on in that era. What is it about? Do you know, you hear all these rumors too about like Keith Richards like regularly getting like blood transfusions and things like that. Like, I don't know if it's all these wives' tales or whatever, but. I've heard stories like, you know, he just, he still hammers booze. I know. They've never been, they, while being ne- more, you, they've never been more disrespectful to their bodies during this right. entire each, time. Each member of the Rolling Stones has their own personal physician. Uh, every day they get, here, this wakes you up. You want to get high. Here's what you take. Now it's time to get, it's almost, almost really? like Elvis. Yes, they all have their own doctors. They, they can still party, um, but they do it in a way that, is sanctioned by their personal physician. Well, share that information. Yeah, does that personal physician that. take yeah. my insurance? Yeah. Does, hey, can wow. I do some LSD? Yeah, here. <laughs> probably, just drink this green the, juice. One of the highest paid gig, the highest paid gig in rock and roll is being Keith Richards' doctor. Oh wow. My God, man. I know. And if he dies, it, it, I mean, no one's going to be pissed at that doctor. No. Right. Like, finally, he, he kicked it. We understand, it. yeah. It's funny that he's always the catalyst. It's like, no matter who dies, it's like, wow, Keith Richards is still alive, <laughs> but... Yeah. This one died, like, you know. He, yeah. He's this, yeah. He's that, like Jimmy Carter is the catalyst for bad presidents. Like not since Jimmy Carter, if we had a president this incompetent. I always think about poor Jimmy Carter sitting at home turning on the news. Not since Jimmy Carter, if we had a, a president that was willing to compromise this country. Like every every guy on Fox. It's always not since Jimmy. Not since Jimmy Carter. Is that well, a that's got, now? Well, I mean, imagine if it was that way. Like with shit comedians, you know what I mean? Not since Mike Vinoy. Has there been a hack comedian? Like, and you've been retired for forty-one I'm years. Like, what the hell, man? Forty. Jimmy Carter hasn't been in office for forty-two years. Forty-three years. Forty-three. Mike Vinoy, you hang it up today. Forty-three years later, now you turn it on Fox, and they're like, "We have not seen a comedy performance this hackneyed and this bad since Mike Vinoy." Meanwhile, I'm four hundred. Pounds, <laughs> you're four hundred pounds, but you 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 gave up the political life to build homes for black people, and, and this is getting... what we give, and this is how we treat you. Huh. Now, yeah, he's a, he he left in eighty. How old is he? Ninety. He's ninety something. All he's done is build houses for That's people. It. And every time a shit president comes along, he has he's to the, watch him be compared. He's the Keith Richards of... Uh, he's, <laughs> he's 99. Come he's on. He's 99. He's 99 Amazing. years old. Wow. Amazing. He's coming on 50 years of just being compared to the worst politician <laughs> ever. All the time. Well, I hope that doesn't happen with my special. <laughs> it could very well happen. <laughs> I know, happen. it yeah. probably could. And I'm going to keep gaining that weight. In an enduring legacy, <laughs> like, that just keeps going, to keep bringing your special the up and going. Not ever. since Mike's special. <laughs> and all shit specials and from all... this day forth will be compared negatively the to yours. The one-way toilet career? Yeah. That's Nonsense. right. Nonsense, don't let me down. That's it, right. Don't it, let me down. Totally let us down. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, a lot of pressure with that name. <laughs> I mean, is there any other is there any other politician who gets compared? No, like, I Like in negative, it's always no. Jimmy Carter. And he's had to hear it this whole time. That's right. <laughs> Man, ninety nine. Let's hope his hearing went. Yeah. Jeez. I know. A Benedict Arnold maybe gets it. 
Yeah, but Benedict Arnold is kind of a punchline now. All right. Yeah. Like you, you, you You're call. a traitor. Yeah, but it'd be, be your, one of your friends who grew up in Pittsburgh and then moved to Dallas and you saw him wearing a Cowboys jersey and be like, Benedict, Benedict Arnold. Arnold. <laughs> but that's not the worst politician <laughs> no. ever, ever to come down the pike. Yeah, it doesn't cut as deep. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, well, the, so and the Beatles, um, so they released a new song last week on Thursday, mm-hmm. and it premiered. And what what happened was, so John, and this it features all four of the original Beatles. So John Lennon, he wrote and recorded this song at his home in New York in the late seventies, and he gave uh, Yoko a tape to give to Paul. Someone should have given her some duct tape and just put it over her fucking mouth. Like the only yeah, tape she should have been received is duct tape <laughs> right. right over the kisser. Yeah, so he gave her the wrong kind of tape. This one wrong uh, tape. was wrong given tape. to Paul. And so Paul, Ringo, and George in 94 um, listened to it, and they started overlaying some bass and some stuff and some mm-hmm. drums and guitar over it. But they couldn't separate John's voice from the piano because it was all one track. So they, they just scrapped it. But now... Because technology and AI has gone so good, they were able to isolate John's vocals, and and, and uh, Paul and Ringo went back into the studio, got an orchestra, and they they overlaid some more intros over. They kept George's guitar parts, and to I mean, uh, last week on Thursday, they released the brand new Beatles song "Now and Then," which will probably be the last song ever released. Uh, it's probably gonna suck, but the orchestra is gonna help build it up. Do you remember when they, they, they did that kind of posthumous, uh, didn't they do Free as a Bird was the yeah, song that they yeah. released when it was all coming? Right. That I, they were I'm not a it. fan of Lennon's solo sit home at the piano mm. Who was your That's favorite solo Beatle? Oh, George. George. Yeah, me too. Yeah, for sure. I love George. Yeah. Dark Horse. And yeah. That whole all era. things must pass. God, it's amazing. So the strings, um, the, the musicians who play the strings, they got them at Capitol Studios. They were... They weren't even told it was a new Beatles song when they were hmm. playing it. Too. All right, let's see if it needed the strings, because the strings sometimes can hide things, like the bustier for the overweight porn star. You know, like, I love your tits, but what's going on? Oh, C-section. I got it. All right, Cedric the Entertainer is here, and I know you guys want to be entertained, so we're going to talk to him. Mike Fanoia, everyone. Not since Jimmy Carter has there been a comedian. <laughs> unfunny. I'm 99, guys. I can still hear you. <laughs> Don't let me down. That'll be out this Thursday, November 9th on YouTube. MikeFanoia.com where you go for some dates. Mike's a very funny guy. So check him out. Always good to see you, Mike. Thank you for having me, man. It's a pleasure. We'll take a break, and we'll have Cedric the Entertainer in studio next. The Jordan Harbinger Show, a different kind of sponsor for this episode, The Jordan Harbinger Show. Well, if you're a fan of fascinating podcasts and interesting people, you should definitely check this one out. There's an episode for everyone, no matter what you're into. Jordan talks with Scott Adams about persuasion in a world where facts don't matter anymore. Man, is he right? Or you go inside the dark world of wildlife trafficking. You'll always find something useful to apply to your own life, like routine changes to boost productivity or slight mindset tweaks to change how you see the world. Jordan's a good guy. We've had him on uh, many times. I know the man well, and he's worth a listen. We enjoy the show, and we know you will, too. So you can search. The Jordan Harbinger Show, that is H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. The Adam Carolla Show presents Cedric the Entertainer's birthday cocktail party for April 24th. Let's see who's invited. Let's welcome the founder of the Farmer's Almanac, Robert Bailey Thomas. The director of The Omen, Twilight Zone, and Lethal Weapon, Richard Donner. Shirley MacLaine is here. Let's welcome novelist Sue Grafton. Barbara Streisand just joined the party. Hey, look, it's the drummer for Credence, Doug Clifford. From Night Ranger, let's welcome Jack Blades and Kelly Clarkson. Cedric the Entertainer is on the Adam Carolla Show. 
That wasn't as strong an offering as I've heard. We had Neil deGrasse Tyson in here the other day. And he, he oh my God, it was a who's who of the most famous people I in mean, the world. You know, Babs was there. I mean, we had Babs. That's not a reflection on you. No. <laughs> and uh, you're, the good news you. is, is you're the best name on their list. <laughs> right. I got well, I got Kelly Clarkson. And but some she's novelist. bragging about you. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and who was the first one? Some, you know, some uh, two, Farmer's like Almanac. Yeah. Well, come on, man. <laughs> Come Do you on, have the, ne- the former almanac dude is he used to be a legend. Do we have Neil deGrasse Tyson's uh one? Just, oh, I don't man. want to make you feel bad, Cedric. When, when, I don't shape these things. I can't. You know what I mean? But you got like the drummer from Night Ranger. Yeah. You, you know <laughs> yeah. Like I mean? no, everybody was like, who's Night Ranger? Oh, that guy. If the right. drummer from Night Ranger was born on Neil deGrasse Tyson's birthday, he would have been left yeah. off the he list. He would have been like, <laughs> hey, not- guys, I'm outside. Yeah, we don't yeah. mean to make you feel bad, but here's how shitty your birthday okay, is. Okay, there right, we go. Here it is. is. The Adam Carolla Show presents oh, wow. Neil deGrasse Tyson's birthday cocktail party wow. for October 5th. Let's see who's here. Here is the 21st president of the United States, Chester A. Arthur. The French inventor who made the first motion picture, Louis Lemire. Let's welcome the pioneer who invented and built the first liquid-fueled rocket, Robert H. Goddard. Fast food entrepreneur, Ray Kroc, is here. From the Three Stooges, let's welcome Larry Fine. From the Halloween series, Donald Pleasance is here. The cartoonist from the Family Circus, Bill Keen. From ACDC, let's welcome Brian Johnson. Pink, from Pink Floyd's The Wall, and the singer of the Boomtown Rats, Bob Geldof. Bernie Mac is here. Let's welcome esteemed attorney, Mark Garrigus. Mario Lemieux is here. Guy Pierce joined the party. Kate Winslet just walked in. Mm. Jesse Eisenberg is here. It's Taylor Swift's boyfriend, Travis Kelsey. And Abracadabra. Let's welcome Steve Miller. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Wow. Yeah, man. Wow. That's a tough draw, your wow, birthday. Wow, man. I, you know, I think, I think the October birthdays meant that people were having a lot more sex when somewhere around <laughs> February, mm. January. And, uh, you know, April birthdays. We just don't get the party like no. that. My no. birthday is almost exactly nine months after Feb- uh, Valentine's Day. Oh, so, really? Yeah. So Are you October? I think about that. Uh, November. No, right here. So you're yeah. right here when it's going down. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, and, and most of the people seem like they would want to be at Neil, De- <laughs> Neil uh, Tyson's Tice yeah. party. The scientists. Yeah. Even the guy that invented French fries. But would you, is, that uh, Ray Kroc. Well, he didn't. Or the guy invented French fries? Oh, was, well, well, Ray, well, we met Ray, fries were kind of. Ray Kroc was McDonald's. It was McDonald's. All right. Now, well, that's what I'm saying. I envy you because you're the king of your list, of your birthday list. Oh, nice. That's you the way to look You go to Neil deGrasse Tyson's list, you're going to get lost. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm going to get mixed in, and people are going to like, oh, man, that guy's got a bag of fries over there. I'm going to yeah, talk to you. Yeah, you want to be the this, king of your list. This guy also it was a, it was another scientist that invented something. He invented a rocket. Little Let, things. Let's not Small Let's stuff. Not get mine. We're here to talk to you. All right. Yeah. No, <laughs> that's what. I, that's Tyson. what I'm saying. Yeah. What so saying. you start. Birthday, uh, we'll bring it. We'll bring it up. You got a novel. Yeah. That's out. Yeah, man. Which I don't know if people saw that one coming. It's called uh, Flipping Box Cars. Yeah. And it's available wherever you buy, buy finer books. It's a thriller and it's I, a period piece too. I, yeah. Where'd that come out of have you been doing it was inside it was inside well you know it was an idea i wanted to write about my grandfather i used to hear these stories about him and never uh never got a chance to meet him he had passed before i was born but my mother and my uncles would talk about him and so i just started to kind of fantasize what his life was like you know and so watching movies like uh devil in the blue dress or series like um boardwalk empire it kind of got him gave me the inspiration to start telling this story Mm-hmm. And so uh, that's it's really how it motivated. I started to write it as a TV show, and then uh, the opportunity to write a novel came came along, and it was just better. It, was, it felt like more long form. I could take my time with it. It was different than trying to write episodic. Is that something you, you've done before? Not a novel. I have a. I do have another book though. I did that. You know, the kind of 
atypical, the jokes that I've written along the way and the mm-hmm. stories I've, lives I've lived as a young comedian, you know, that kind of book. Yeah, whatever, so, yeah called uh, Grown Ass Man. So that book, is, yeah, that book's, uh, I think that's like old one, maybe. A grown <laughs> right. Ass Man. Down. But pe- people would see that one coming from you, but maybe yeah. not this, this one. So how did you grow up? I grew up. I grew up in a single parent household, Missouri. First, we lived in a small town called Carothersville, Missouri, which is in the Boot Hill uh, near the Arkansas border. Arkansas, mm-hmm. Tennessee is all right there, the Boot Hill of Missouri. Uh, and then my mother was a school teacher. Uh, and then uh, after my grandmother passed, we moved to St. Louis. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I kind of had my adolescent years in St. Louis, all high school, junior high school, stuff like that, where I started to formulate my personality. So so I consider myself a St. Louis dude as well as Crossville, though. And what was high school like for you? Uh, high school was cool, man. You know, it was back then, you know, we were we were in a suburban part of the city that was starting to change. So we were the first black people to kind of move in, a few of us. And then so the school was probably 70, 30 at the time. And, you know, but a lot of fun. white. Yeah, 70 white, 30. And then it was starting, to, you know, but by the time I graduated, it had flipped. You know, it was definitely a, an area where it was just more black people moving in that whole that whole area of uh, of the St. Louis County, and so, uh, but you know, I, I was a fun kid. Like, like I had a lot of fun, you know, good time. wasn't a class clown, but definitely was one of the people that you know had a very very popular. A lot of a lot of friends. A lot of you know, cool cool vibe at the school. Man, it was good. And when did comedy start? trickling in oh man well, of course you know that's in high school you do the the dozens you know the the stuff in the lunchroom so i was i was good at that not as a you know a pro but i was the, definitely the guy that if anybody started you know talking about you know your clothes or you know you know outfits or you know facial body you know deformities anything we you know kids we just come in i come and light you up and uh, that was my move so so yeah, that was in high school, but I didn't really start it professionally or try it till after I graduated from college and everything. It was I was working for State Farm and started doing comedy at the Funny Bone in St. Louis. What was so you and I are the same age, and I was that I was the class clown of North Hollywood High, and I uh, they would they understood I was funny, but nobody cared, and I mean yeah. nobody no faculty and no guidance counselor like no one ever pulled me aside and went hey you're funny like maybe you could do something with this it was a lot of sit down and shut ups but yet they they were aware of it enough to know that i got class clowns so they knew back then like here's what i'm saying yeah i think now they're they put an emphasis on trying to find out a kid's talent or an interest at least like what does that kid gravitate toward and then if a kid was doing something then a counselor would say you know maybe you're not great at math and maybe you're not great at english but you should be doing this because this is what's in you now they didn't do that when i was young but did they ever do it with you you know they tried i mean you're right i think that we definitely grew up with that kind of think it was starting to be the thing you know so like they made you want to learn skills or whatever. I mean, we we had like car. We can fix cars at school. Yeah, auto shop. Wood shop. We had. They, they actually made guys start learning how to type. I remember that. Like that was a big thing for me in high school. They made the boys type. You had yeah. to learn how to because I guess they knew computers were coming, but nobody said it. But you know, like it was necessary for you. I don't to know think how to they type. knew computers were coming. I don't know, but they used to be really serious about. It. I only like typing class because girls were in there. Yeah, you know, it's was, so such a weird time, but typing was for women yeah. only. Oh. Yeah, you wouldn't think and it still to type. is. Yeah, no, that's right. No, <laughs> no, barefoot, Cut naked. That yeah, get in there, get in there, and type me a letter. <laughs> Never mind. Yeah, women type, guys dictated. There's no reason why a guy would learn to type because he'd never be a secretary. That was right. kind yeah. of, and he would never like work at a bank sitting over a typewriter, like for an airline or something. That was all women's yeah. work. Like even when you, because you, you go back to World War II, and all the women would be sitting there banging away, you know, yeah. in the office, and the men were out on the battlefield. Like that's yeah. that's how we looked at it. So if a guy got pushed into a typing class back then, that was a that was a weird thing. Like that, was, yeah. that was like taking the football player and put him into drama class. Yep, you didn't do that either. Even right. even though acting was kind of a, considered a, a great 
thing for those, you know, the the you know, the the big acting stars, they were great, but I guess they all had to be considered handsome or something, you know, if that was the case. Otherwise, you wouldn't be picked to be an actor, but they actually my guidance teacher led me to be a lawyer. Really? Uh, mainly because I guess I was uh, you know, with the comedy the back and forth of it or whatever, you can you was considered a great debater. So mm-hmm. he thought that was a debate skill. And it's like you if you hone that that craft, learn to take those arguments and those those pushbacks you give me in class, mm-hmm. <laughs> then you can be a great lawyer one day, an attorney. So I actually went to school with pre law and then as soon as I went to college, the my my first the uh, advisor at college heard my voice and then convinced me to come to do radio and stuff in, in college. So, wow. So then that led kind of to the more artsy stuff, like more, you know, open me up to think about, oh, they had a TV, they had a small cable network at the school. So we did a TV show. I started doing commercials. Like it was all those things started to open you up to the creative side. So you had yeah. people in your life that were trying to shape you and guide you. Yeah, like, you know, but like much later, though, I think, you know, I mean, my mother, who was a, you know, English, a reading professor, a reading specialist, I'm sorry, but was uh, was, you know, more about go to go to school, get a degree, work at some corporation. That was the job. You know? And you single mom. But was your dad in the picture? No, not really. I mean, he was around. We knew who he was, but he lived in different places. He stayed in St. Louis for a while. Then he moved to Memphis. You know, he would he was around, but not like you know, you know, not in any kind of daily basis. We know, you know, we 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 operated with him in in our life though. When you broke out and people started to know who you were, did your dad change his tune? Was he around? Yeah, I mean, not not really. He never really tried to hang on like that. Like he never tried to. Like, you know, like just be a part of the situation. He was proud and, you know, and I and I grew older and was able to become more forgiving and understanding of what it's to like to be a young father with kids. Even though, you know, I was the kid at the time, I was really hard on him. But then, you know, as I started to have relationships, I understood that some of these choices of him not being around wasn't always his because mm-hmm. he was young. He was drinking a lot. My mom just wasn't playing that. Mm. Is he, how long did he, is he alive now? Yeah, he's still alive. My mom's passed, but my dad's still alive. Wow. And so he's seen your entire journey. Yeah, man. Yeah, so, you know, and I go and I go and check on him. He lives in Memphis. I go and hang out, check on him, you know. Um, and, and so he, he's still cool. We, you know, we started to golf together at a certain, you know, age of my life where that was our kind of way to connect and be operate more like friends. Did he ever have his. that that moment where he was like, "Sorry, son, I wasn't around as much as I could have could have been." <laughs> that would have been nice. <laughs> <laughs> I would have loved, loved to hear the scene, like the, with the music in the backdrop. Yeah, he never really, you know, me, my sister and I were talking about that the other day. He never quite ever owned up to any of his side of it like it never was like he just you know let's dive back in hopefully y'all understand that's very much the i think those fathers back in the day they just kind of well they always do my usual my dad was twice as bad or whatever they'll they'll do that but it's an interesting i think it's harder to say too i mean maybe they're just doing it by action like let's just do as many activities as we can and let's just try to reset but you're you're as the child or, or really the one that and a lot of times are provoked to keep the relationship alive. You know, I think about, uh, like, Jay-Z says that a lot about his dad. Or, you know, people, they, they decide to make the choice to go and forgive. And, they, you know, to not, you know, to not let it end with this, me holding this grudge, right? Like, forget that part. And it usually comes with success. Once you're successful, then you. I guess if I was still like struggling and poor, I'd be like, "You bastard!" But you know, with success, you're like, "Hey, man, you know what? It's all good." Now man. you know it's like parking tickets. When you're yeah. poor and you get a parking ticket for uh, forty four bucks, you're like, "Fuck!" Right? Fuck! When you're rich, you get one. You're like, ah, "All yeah. right, someone's going. Assistant's going to take care of this shit." Yeah. But it's less devastating yeah. when you have money. Everything yeah, is everything less. Everything's like, ah, you know, it's okay. Yeah, it's like, yes. It, it, everything is sort of yeah, less. All the tub flooded. You know, all the bathroom flooded over. We'll fix it. Yeah, yeah. And everything <laughs> when you're poor, so everything casual. is everything is devastating. <laughs> devastating. I uh, left. Man. I I screwed up and left like forty dollars in an ATM once. Oh man! When I was poor, somehow 
I, it was a, I didn't spit it out right or something. Somehow I left and I left the 40 bucks in there and I realized it. It was like ruined my weekend. Yeah. Destroyed. Yeah. Now you give a $40 tip yeah. at a Chili's, you know. If you're in a, a good, if you're in a good mood, like that? it wouldn't care. <laughs> Tipping well. You know That's what? what Here you go. Take the thanks for those spring rolls. <laughs> so you're the best ones. I was reading that uh, you used to have a fun set aside for your family. Yeah, man. Which uh, talking about family, and you just every year, just since you became successful, yeah, just sort of set aside, set aside. some money. Twenty five k. Twenty five k for whatever. You whatever. Know, whatever people, if they called and they needed it, we'd break it off. Try not to give it to any one person, but mm -hmm. but people can get you know you know they, you know kids are going to school or it's you know it's prom and we wanted to rent a car and you know and this or that or I had the house had a situation, so you know and then I had like one and then I started to have those one relatives that were closer to me like try to have their own money. You know, they need like, their yeah, own slush those, fund. Now I know what those guys, you know. know <laughs> right. You know how they do. I'm not them. I'm me. Well, I, I've, I've talked to a thousand celebrities about helping their families out. Yeah. It's never worked it out. It never works out. It, but I start to think about it. It's not just micro. It's it's macro. It's big. The, the people that hate me the most on the planet are the people I've done the most <laughs> of for. Of course. And I think now I start thinking about the government, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like the people who get the most from the government hate that. My mom was on welfare and food stamps and hated the government. I'm yeah. like, you of all people should like the government because yeah. they're keeping That's you it. alive. Didn't trust them, didn't like them, but took the money, took money from them, you know? And then all the other people I knew who paid the government money and, and taxes had no problem with the government. Yeah. So I think that's what goes on. I don't know if it's shame. I don't know what it is. But you you just, you can't hand people stuff. They end up resenting you. It's always like, yeah, the idea of what's a, the accountability, right? And, and it, it definitely ended that. It, it got to that point to where, you know, it was an issue, that it wasn't enough. And mm -hmm. that I was being, you know, extra selective. My sister used to do the the fun. I would stay out of the way. I was like, look, you have to go through her. And she was, you know. She would handle it. She was, she's the little sister. She's like, what? <laughs> you know, come over here with no lame. Come over here with no little lame yeah. excuses. How no. many people are we talking about? You know, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 was a, it went around, too. It went, like, outside. Because it was just my sister and I and my immediate family. So, you know, I had I had one one set of cousins. It was eleven of them. Oh, you know. oh man! Then I had you know. Then I had another set of cousins that were, you know, they lived in Chicago, some down south. You know, it, yeah, it was. I would I would say probably thirty forty people in that group that you know. Did you have to cut off the fund eventually? Yeah, eventually I just stopped it. It just started to be like really stressful, you know, because the more money I made, the more people thought it needed to be bigger. Like they just, people would just call and just literally ask for down payments for homes and stuff yeah. like that, just like it was nothing. Yeah. Like, you know, I want to get a house for, you know, the family and it's like 40000 down. I know uh, Anthony Anderson's a good friend of yours. I've seen yes. this, uh, you guys doing your barbecue yeah, man. stuff. Um, I don't want to talk about that, but I had the crazy, craziest conversation with it because it made me think about family. And then I was over at uh, Jimmy Kimmel's for his Christmas party, and I was sitting next to Anthony Anderson, and we were having some drinks. And I was explaining to him that uh, my mom died, but I haven't told my kids yet. And it's been like six months. Wow. And... Anthony said, and it was a weird, now he loves his mom. Yes. At least on TV. Yeah, he does. But it's, yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. So he couldn't even fathom how <laughs> I didn't like my mom, you know? Right. But I said to, uh, I said to Anthony, this is, this was Christmas. So Jimmy's party's the day before Christmas. Yeah, yeah. So he's at Christmas Eve. Or is it Christmas? Yeah, it's Christmas <laughs> Eve. Christmas Eve. And I was explaining that I had a problem, which is my stepdad did not die. He's still alive. Right. And he got a new girlfriend. And then he said to me, can I bring my new girlfriend to your house wow. for Christmas? Whoa. And I was like, sure, no problem. And I didn't think about it anymore. But then Aunt Anthony <laughs> reminded me that I didn't tell my kids that 
that their mom, wow. their grandmother died, <laughs> and that my stepdad is going to show up with their new his new girlfriend. Works quick. And then started laughing maniacally. He yes. went insane. He laughed and yes. laughed yes. and yes. laughed. That's a good one. I, I had to write. You should. I told him I had to take. Should you? You are now on the clock. You have tomorrow afternoon to take care of this with your kids. Otherwise, it's yes. This is your stepdad's yeah. going to show up with a new woman. This is an episode of Curb. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I was like, he said, "Tell me what happens. Tell me what happens." And I was, I was texting him like, "I'm going to tell my son today." Um. So again, I completely spaced on it, and I thought my mom. Oh wow! I thought my stepdad was going to show up with his new girlfriend to my house that afternoon. So I, I took my son out who's 16 at the time. And I just said, uh, listen, I don't know if you know about this, but, uh, your grandma passed away. You know. Yeah. <laughs> goes, I know that. I don't know. He, go, he, he goes, he goes, why tell me now? I go, cause I thought you should know. And he goes, but now, why now? Like, <laughs> yeah, why are we taking? Cool. Why are we take seven months off? And now, right, the, today is the day you tell me. Mm-hmm. I go, well, just <laughs> you know, I have my reasons, you know. But I'm telling you now. And he goes, no, nah, I, I already knew. Mom told us already. And I was like, oh, I wish someone had told me. Well, they didn't tell me. So then I didn't have to do my daughter because my daughter got the information. <laughs> yeah. But then I was like, all right, kids, your grandma's dead. And your stepdad showing up with a new I squeeze. Love the okay, yeah. so do not be surprised. Act cool. And yeah. then that you know, ding dong, open the doors. My stepdad stand there. I go, uh, where's your girlfriend? He goes, ah, she stayed at home. <laughs> After all, all of that, all that, all the all, whole build up. He all of that. But yeah. yes, that's my. I would have loved. Yeah, I would have loved for him to walk in with like Trixie or some. <laughs> yeah, the new hot. Yeah, like, maybe well, maybe like maybe maybe it. like like Amber Rose. Yeah, it's just like oh, like in, so in some form fitting. Yeah, like a, uh, I yeah that that whole thing. Like what was the little Anna Nicole Smith yeah. that energy? Like oh my yeah. god, like kissing on on them. Like, yeah, <laughs> inappropriate. Well, those chicks are there for the money. Yeah, and my stepdad. So, no, not no, not, so not so much with the money. Not so much. All right, we'll take a break. Break. We'll come back with a Cedric the Entertainer. Yeah, man. Right after this. Hey, I don't know if you guys know, but it's See Better Drive Safer Month now at O'Reilly Auto Parts. They have put a spotlight on items to help you see the road more clearly. All month long, receive gift cards after rebate on select wiper blades and bulbs. If your wiper blades are streaking and smearing, well, they're worn out and they need to be replaced. But good news, you can get up to a $20 O'Reilly gift card after rebate with purchase of select wiper blades. Their professional parts people will install your new wiper blades and they'll do it for free. See the road better with new bulbs? Get up to a $15 O'Reilly gift card after rebate with the purchase of Sylvania Silver Star Ultra or select ZXE Twin Pack Bulbs. They'll even help you pick out the right bulb for your vehicle. Visit your local O'Reilly Auto Parts store for details. O Rewards members receive two times O Rewards points on select bulbs and up to four times points on cleaning supplies for your vehicle. Don't miss the See Better Drive Safer Month now at your local O'Reilly Auto Parts store or shop online at O'ReillyAuto.com. Cedric the Entertainer is here. He's got a novel out, Flipping Boxcars, also a documentary, which is very good, Meme Gods. Cedric's the executive producer on that, and uh, we have a date, which we'll tell you in the future when that thing's dropping. But I saw it in a full house with uh, Cedric, and it played funny. Yeah, man, it was good. I I think that it was a really... um uh, a fun idea that we've been developing for a while. I and mean, then um, uh, Nate, your guy, came in and uh, helped produce and made you know, turn it into a thing, man. So, uh, you know, it's all about the world of memes, you know. And, I mean, you know, that that's the biggest way that uh, one of those new forms of getting art and, and news, people like really creative coming up with memes and sending them to you, making you laugh every day. So we thought we'd feature it and do a, a documentary on it. It was pretty cool. I think we have a couple of clips, by the way, to play. We have the uh, 
faceless. Oh, this is uh, Eliza Schlesinger. Yeah. Or, uh, Eliza. So. Howie Mandel's going to be in it, too. Cedric, Neil Brennan. Yeah, it's a lot of good names. Uh, yeah. So. The people that make these are tapping into something incredibly intelligent and smart in terms of, like, skating social commentary. A meme artist? I don't know who they are. Is a funny person that has the best memes or the best content. In my mind, they're all young. They're all handsome. <laughs> They all have got great deals, and Sprite pays them a lot of money. I don't know why it's Sprite. I don't know where these come from, but these are funny. Like, I don't like when real comedian friends of mine send me memes. They don't, I don't think they know that, like, there's a meme industry teaming up just beneath the surface. No one knows you, memers. You're faceless. You're not known. Do something. Put your face next to your meme. Yeah, like, like not a lot of people get credited for, for memes, and they get shared all over. It's a business, too. Oh, and they, they, we, we found out, like, that was that, that's a really a big part. There was a lot of anger there, a lot of, you know, aggression about someone stealing a meme and, and kind of placing it up as their own. So that whole idea of reposting or giving me my credit, mm -hmm. what are they going to do? Tag me. You got to tag, tag me, me, man. Right. You can't just put my thing up without tagging me. You're like, whoa. Like it's a it's a knockdown drag out well, kind of thing. It's like jokes. I mean, I mean they are jokes, and it's it's yeah. cutthroat industry. Yeah, yeah, and and there's always a thought that oh, as a comedian, whenever you see a really funny meme, you go, "Oh, why didn't I think of that?" Yeah, that's, that's so true. It's it's a real why didn't you think of it? When you hear a joke that's funny, you think sometimes why didn't I think of that? But comedians have so many different styles that you go, well, "That really wouldn't work for me." Yeah, that's his style, you know. But yeah. in a meme, you see the picture of it, and it's so concrete. You go, I should have thought of that. <laughs> yeah, and it's funny. And they're, they're, there's more now. Bless you, Cedric. Yeah. There's more. I mean, they just keep coming. I mean, and, it's the quickest way to consume comedy right now. I oh, man. And, you, and when you get them, you love them. Like a really good one every day. Like someone sends something over that's really funny. You're like, man, this is... It's effective. It's just so unique and right to the point, right? You know, you, know, you always appreciate somebody who can really do it. It's like a logo. If yes. it's effective, it's, it's in a way, it has to be simple and yeah. you have to be able to read it from a highway going 70 miles an <laughs> yeah, hour. because that's when and you And you know them. what it is. But there's a certain genius in simplicity. And yeah. it's like a brilliant logo is that way and a brilliant meme is that way. Everyone gets it. Everyone knows it. And, and, and no one, you won't be confused by it. And you won't disagree with it. You'll know exactly <laughs> what it is. Yeah, I, and I, you know, so I, it was really great to feature these guys because that for that reason, and I, you know, and I think you know this movie should you know it should it, it should pop you know the documentary people should enjoy it. It's funny. Get it out there. There is tons of tons of laughs in it. And uh, I know you guys talked about the Michael Jordan meme in the in the movie. Uh, you're you're friends with Michael, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that was one of the. The biggest ones, and I thought he did such a great job at Kobe's, you know, oh, funeral awesome. when he brought it, when he rec recognized it and brought it back up. You know, what I'm saying so, because that's the that's really was the effect of that meme. Like everybody could use it for anything <laughs> that was super sad. Yeah, just do the crying Jordan meme, and he's like, oh. I heard I heard he was upset with you one time for wearing Adidas to his oh, party. Oh man, oh man, it, that's one of those ones, man. <laughs> you know, I I performed for him like several times, man. Like at his, uh, he would do uh, he would do a big golf tournament and then his birthday party. So he would have these birthday parties too that, and he would hire you to come perform. And so I came out on stage wearing shell toe adidas you're like run like, dmc yeah well they were like they just look better with a suit mm -hmm. like most, he made <laughs> he made basketball shoes yeah and so i was like dog so i had on like a suit and i wanted to be we were in the bahamas i didn't want to wear any dress shoes so i was like sure. let me throw these tennis shoes on like and you know and i mean as soon as i walked out <laughs> state he saw me immediately like hey i didn't even get to have a joke <laughs> i was like yo i walked out he was like hey What's that? I was like, what's what? Come on, man. I looked down. I was like, oh, damn. <laughs> the first time I realized I was wearing Adidas, I was like, Ugh. Right. I was like, hey, man, let's, let's do a shoe deal then. Let's do a deal. Let me be the first comic with a shoe deal. We did design I some. mean, that kind of attitude got him into the, the Billionaire Boys Club, right? Yeah. What? That... 
that kind of attitude, right? Like, oh, hey, yeah, the for brand. Sure. Uh, he's like that with everybody. I've, I've got several friends with that same story. Like, they wore the wore some other brand around him. He's not having it. <laughs> it was a good way to get free Jordans, though. Like, because I definitely, <laughs> I definitely start oh, getting yes. boxes of shoes. <laughs> he's like, what size you wear? I was like, 13. You know, like, <laughs> hey. You see it? I was like, yeah, I started getting boxes of shoes for many years. Was, was the uh, original Kings of Comedy, is that when it started to really blow up for you? Yeah, I mean, for sure. That 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 time, well, you know, I actually I was actually doing the Steve Harvey show before yeah. then mm-hmm. on, on WB. But again, WB was a new network. So I was still like, you know, marginally famous. But, you know, the... The Kings of Comedy was the big movie. It was MTV, was, you know, the, the the studio. Spike Lee came on and directed. So we had all of that kind of, you know, publicity around it. And that's when things started to blow. And the tour was huge, man. We were doing, you know, we were doing arenas, you know, three and four times. We did like four United Centers, four MCI Centers in, in, um, in D.C. It was a big energy tour right you know like so that's that's definitely when the fame came and and those butt light commercials i gotta be honest so that was probably one of the that was maybe a little bit before that because uh, i used to do those butt light commercials and i did the one that won the super bowl and that was the first time i was re- really starting to be noticed in the airport like when you just kind of mm-hmm. walk in and people look over hey hey you're yeah. the guy Cool. Yeah, so that was that was a little bit right before Kings, I think. I mean, that was a legendary tour, and I remember it playing in theaters. Like this was a, a movie then that that was yeah, play actually in national chains. Uh, but then I heard that you guys didn't do a tour because there was a beef between Steve and the late great Bernie Mac. Yeah, well, we had did the tour before. We didn't go again. We That's never I mean, did a yeah. second one because yeah, those, those two they you know they they had a little you know a little, little something that they didn't yeah, they didn't get along with each other for a minute there. I don't. Nobody knows what it was about. It never. I don't even think you know. In hindsight, when you mm-hmm. think about it, it probably wasn't even. Anything, everybody yeah. was like, "What? What were we even mad about?" But you know. You know, hubris, attitude, who's the man and why, and all that kind of stuff. How'd they work out com- who who opened, common. who went first, who how, did you guys rotate, yeah. how much time you did? You know, so we did the first year. We it was, The first year was just me, Bernie, and Steve as the main acts, and uh, Guy Tory. Guy Tory was the, the MC. He MC and opened the show, you know, kept it going. And so, um, so I was first. I was the youngest one on the crew. Uh, Steve had just did like a big HBO special, so he wanted to go be last. He, that was the kind of feeling. Bernie had just did a national tour on his own where he had a whole band and everything, and he, he wanted to be in the hammock. That's what he called it. He was like, I don't I don't want to work hard. I want to be in the hammock. I'll sit back and relax. <laughs> See better and do my thing and stay with me the fuck better. <laughs> the hammock. The hammock. He's like, I'm in the hammock, baby. Yeah, go ahead. And so he really wanted to do that the whole time. The so hammock is in between. In between, yeah. where right. it's like two big things right. holding you up and you comfortable. <laughs> right. You don't have to worry about it. And he did that the whole time, really. Even on this even on the special, he actually was in that spot. We just they when they cut it, they made they made him last because of language, but but he that night after the second run of the tour, I used to go last. I was the last one on the show, so we just kind of did it. Like Bernie never wanted to go last. Steve ended up wanting to, he wanted to host after the first run, and we added DL, and that's how we did the tour almost uh, every night after that. How much time would you do? Everybody did thirty minutes. It was perfect. It was, it was perfect. It's easy. It's the best. Dog. You can because you can write like some new stuff and have a good time. Uh, you know, and, and as well as have a, know that you got a solid show, but you can also with a thirty minute set write two, three new jokes and see if they work. And then if not, you got you know this other few minutes to kill. Like ah, that you was it. Hammock it was the new stuff in between the stuff. Yeah, that works. so you knew you hammock the, this. We're gonna make this a magic. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I like it. Gonna hammock word. everything. I did the Bernie Mac show with. The TV show? Yeah. Uh, with uh, Charles Barkley. That's a great show. Oh, I man. think. <laughs> yeah, he, you know, and that was that was one that got became motivated from Kings of Comedy because he did that little joke at the, you know, in the existen- existentials <laughs> where he was like, yo, y'all scared of me. Y'all want me to do no show. 
<laughs> and the joke about you know having his sister's kids, all that stuff was how he formulated the Bernie Mac show. Yeah, he was funny. He was funny in uh, o- no shit. Oceans, Oceans. Oceans movies. Yeah, he was in Oceans, but I was also he was in Transformers too, wasn't he? He was. Yeah, he was a yeah. car salesman. He was always yeah. funny. I couldn't understand half of what he was saying, but yeah. it made me. He, he was always super funny. Uh, how funny! I do. We we love him in uh, <laughs> Players Club. Everybody like <laughs> in the hood. That's the Ice Cube movie that he. he he Ice Cube directed, and Bernie Mac played the strip club owner. And he's got some funny scenes in there. <laughs> what year is that from? Oh, with the Players Club? Mm, that's that's got to be interesting. I, I'm going to go early 2000s, uh, maybe maybe 02, 03, somewhere in there. That's what I think. It, it was 98, after. I'm saying. 98? Yeah. The Players Club? Yeah, wow. That's, what they're saying. that's crazy. Well, we're getting Life old. Life is wild. <laughs> Wild yeah, it's wild. That's wild, man. What a great time just touring those massive arenas, and it was so much fun, man. I mean, you know, it was rock star comedy, you know, because you know, you 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 start in these small clubs, especially in the Midwest, you never even visualize that that kind of uh, you know that kind of party going on. I I I had I would have all the celebs come back into my dressing room, hang out, drink, cause. Bernie was not a really a big drinker, and Steve didn't drink at the time. So I was the I was the derelict on tour, man. I had the drinks and the cigars and the weed. It was my room was the rock and roll room, <laughs> man. I was I was the one, man. How'd the Michael Jordan connection start up? Uh, you know that, that you know that kind of started. You know you know you you one of the popular comedians, and they they called. They, I came. Um, he was doing like a camp back in North Carolina. You know, early in his career, and I went to go and perform at the camp, and you know, mm-hmm. you know, did a good job. We hung out, laughed, started, you know, formulating a friendship, and that was kind of like it. You know, so from there on out, whenever I was available, I was his guy. Like he just called and won't say it to come. So, what do you think about uh, Scotty Pippen and his son and that whole thing? Like it, Larsa, you, you like, like it? it? Yeah. You like it? <laughs> come on, man. You know, let's figure, good for you. <laughs> let's find some. Let's find some old cougars and. Fall in love, man. No, I don't know. I don't know, man. Life is life is nowadays. I'm definitely just more tolerant to what the world has. I have <laughs> no opinion wow. about people, man, because you know she actually is a very young energy personality. I, she probably was hella young when she was with Scotty. When you think mm-hmm. about it, mm-hmm. you know they had children or whatever. But I think about her like when she was with Scotty. She was a young lady then, you know, and now so she's what like. Seven, eight years older than Marcus or something now. Does, so I, it, did you find this weird, especially when you get older? But I mean, you know, Scottie Pippen and Michael Jordan. Like, did, you know, why why aren't they getting along? Why isn't it uh, Bernie Mac and yeah. Steve Harvey? You know, like why shouldn't they get? You know, why does this always We're have to be? Rooting for them. Why does everyone in a band have to hate everyone. the other guy in the band? You've made millions and millions of dollars. You've you've yes. you've you you changed the world. Why? Yeah. Why isn't there enough to go around? Why is this? And why does that always happen? What's that wiring? And then there's the other people that are wired or like, hey, let's enjoy it. Like, let's yeah. think about bands and how much money has been left on the table just with music because they wouldn't yeah. go out and with this tour guy, back like together. Him, I don't like that guy, yeah, right. right. And it, I mean, you know, and I don't imagine like doing anything. It kind of kind of goes back to your point though. When when people are poor and struggling we all can figure out you can tolerate somebody's personality you can get along your boss you can start, be the biggest asshole in the world once you get some money though you like look i'm not i'm not going for I'm not your putting shit up man. With this. i'm yeah. not listening to that you know and, and, and it's it's a it's it's a it's gotta be hard when someone is like especially if people like disrespect the process or whatever you know i don't know i never really saw that we all had our time so i don't know exactly what their gripe was but you know but why shouldn't Jordan and Pippen get along? I mean, <laughs> I don't my know. son is boinking your ass. Oh, but I mean, before but that. Before they that. Along. Well, my son was thinking about boinking your ass. <laughs> I was my planning. Son, my son really was yeah. on his ninth nice birthday. He very plan. much did it. A, hey, where's your wife? Uncle Scotty. You, you think know? that's the genesis? <laughs> no. <laughs> maybe, your wife, may, Uncle <laughs> maybe he wore Adidas in the house. <laughs> Oh, I could be into, yeah, a little bit of both. Oh my God, I, I don't know, man. Like, uh, 
But you're right. I mean, you think about you know it really showed up on the uh, last the, dance. The, oh, right. wow. I wasn't I wasn't ready for it. I wasn't. I thought that when I saw the last dance, I thought it was pretty cool. I thought it, you know kind of told the story the way I recall it too. But Scotty was upset. I played golf with him sometime, and he was just upset about that. And I was like, man, I didn't know he was that mad about it. Like, okay, huh. he saw it completely different. And again, once you're inside the story. The story is different, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, you know, that's why people get divorced. Some people see see these things as like, oh man, they they're perfect together. But inside the relationship, there's some I, stuff you just can't stand, man. Yeah, and and it's like I think maybe his legacy was feeling like it wasn't on his own terms anymore. And that's Scotty or Michael? Scotty. Scotty's, yeah. It's, it was I Michael's like that terms. Michael, I like that he just has a big tumbler of scotch and a fat cigar every time he does an interview. Yeah. That's yeah. what I like. Oh, him him looking at the iPad, that's a meme. Or and yeah. I took that personally. That's uh, a meme, like uh, from, from The Last Dance. Uh, Larsa is 49, Scotty Pippen's ex, and Marcus is 32. So there's uh, 16 it's, years. 16 years. Yeah. I'm happy. I'm I just, happy. I, you yeah. know what the other, what people don't understand? Same thing parents don't understand. When you don't get along, you're being unfair to your children. And when yeah. Bernie Mac and Steve Harvey don't get along, it's no fair to you and Deal Hughley or whoever's on the whoever's on the, the, on the roster. On the, on the you, real. Yeah, it's like you because yeah. you feel the tension and you have to kind of deal with it and kind of work around it a yeah. little bit. Right? It definitely ruined the business, right? Because even to this day, Kings of Comedy is still like a big title. It's a big name. People know it. They recognize us as such. And we left all that business on the table. I like, mean, guys could have gone thing. out toured every year, like every Bruce year. Springsteen. You, we could add a whole serious radio station. We can be You'd a be number of things. Sphere. We could, yeah, we could be at the Sphere. We can have... You know, cookbooks and all what, kinds was of stuff. It, like, who was it more, Bernie or Steve? That didn't you know, want again, it? I had no idea like exactly what it was. I just, you know, I hung with Steve a lot more because we did the show together, right, right. and then, but I knew, you know, I knew Bernie well, so I, there was talks like right before Bernie passed that we were going to do it again. We were going to, we everybody was cool. We figured it out, you know. I just think it was a moment in time, you know, like mm-hmm. whatever that moment was. It got bigger. Uh, Steve said something in the article, and that was it. You know, like he made some comment that Bernie was like, "That's it." He drew a line in the sand, and that's that. And and so again, you know, it was between them, whatever it was, because it never really happened in front of anybody else. Like we, whenever they saw each other, whenever we was on tour, it was always just business as usual. So it wasn't like they fought in the hallway or something. You know what I mean? Right. Did you guys uh, and Steve Harvey? I haven't heard from him in a uh, while. Yeah, Harvey just yeah, man. He just I don't know. Harvey's rich as hell. I'm like, <laughs> so he, he does. I just saw him. He came down to my uh, golf tournament. We were in Cabo uh, uh, August. I did my charity golf tournament. And he came and hung. And Dio was there. So that was a good time, man. So, uh, but he he spends a lot of time in in the Middle East at, in Abu Dhabi doing something. He's got business over there. Uh, he took Family Feud and had a. It's got his own version of that in Africa, like a couple of countries in Africa. Um, he's busy, man. He just he just stay busy. The radio show. He's got his radio show every day. That's still rocking. Family Feud, the game shows, the Judge Show. Oh, that's yeah, right. Yeah. Thing, yeah, I love him thing, as a man. That dude is busy, yeah. man. Is D.L. Hewley? Was he originally D.L. Hugely? It's hugely like so. Hugh-ly. Yeah, yeah, when you spell it, it's huge, L E Y. Hugely, hugely. Because I've been arguing yeah. with someone about this for a long time. Yeah, <laughs> he was, thought it was hugely. <laughs> we have to show the Hugleys. Yeah, yeah the Hugely. Yeah. Oh, the he Hugh-ly's. did have the Hugleys, yeah. right? Yeah. The Hugleys, yep. And he's yeah. Got the, I would say Hugely, and he'd say hugely. Yep. But then he said he it's changed Hughley. it. Hughley. Hughley. Yeah. Hugh so, Hughley. Yeah. Hughley. Hughley. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So he's got like, yeah. And he's got, you know, he's got his radio show still popping. We tour a lot still. We were just together last week uh, in North Carolina. So he, still, he stays busy waiting on this strike to go. He's got some TV shows in development. So, you know. Oh, yeah. The actor strike's still mm. going. Yeah. Hmm. That sucks for you. Yeah, man. You I mean, got a bunch of stuff like chambered, ready to go. Chambered, ready to go, man. I've been, you know, I'm on that uh, sixth season of the neighborhood on CBS, yep. but we also produce. So I got like two, three other shows going. I got one with Tracy Morgan in, in ready to shoot and go down the pike, and a couple other ones. Uh, I got a show we produce on uh, 
Bouncing at Work, uh, called Johnson. That's a great show. Just a lot, a lot of stuff that's just really being held up right now. I'm glad Tracy's still working. I mean, he he made a lot of money off that crazy accident. Oh hell, the Walmart. But he spent it all Ferraris and fish tanks. <laughs> Huge fish tanks. Man. <laughs> He's a big fish tank guy. Oh my god, he, he loves. He went loves nuts with spent it all on <laughs> saltwater tanks. Yeah, it's like literally with Jacques Cousteau in it, like it's just like down in there. Like this dude, this dude fish tank is crazy in his house. Octopus, big sharks, it's really? crazy. Oh yeah, it's it's sea it's the yeah, entire it's sea crazy. represented in his living room. Yeah, he's got to have you know like the, the actual scientists come over to clean it, like you know pool, real pool people. Oh, they yeah, they uh, use a diving bell. Okay. I mean, it, it's a it's a serious. Well, that's the move when you when you run into that much money, you got to get a Ferrari and a fish tank. Yeah, several yeah. Bugattis. He's got like Lambos. So many cars. Yeah, you get some Lambos and you get some fish tanks. I said Ferrari for yeah. alliteration. Yeah, Ferraris and fish people. tanks yeah. would be the name yeah. of his reality show, right? Nice. Yeah. I like that Ferrari. Pitch and fish that tanks. to him. I haven't yeah. talked yeah. to him in a while. Okay, I got that. I like I like that Ferraris guy. Ferraris and fish tanks. Oh no, he got hilarious though, man. What's he first, had, when you started really raking in the big bucks, what was the first big thing you bought? Oh uh, man, let me see. That, you know, I bought I bought I bought a couple of houses like right away. That was kind of my move. But then the first yeah. thing that I went and bought, I bought a Rolls Royce Cash. So that cash. Was, yeah. So, but not with my not with my movie money or TV money. I went and did went on the road and got it. And so it was fun to do. That's because cool. it was like the idea that that car was like four. At the time, it was like 420 or something, like 420. And I was like, and then my my business manager was like, you can't spend your <laughs> your movie money on that. Like, I was like, so I was like, all right, cool. So on the weekends while I was shooting the movie, I would just go out and make these shows. And I just did it till I made the money. And I was like, I came That's in and cool. bought a cash. That was fun. What year was it? That was 04. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was 04, man. Can't just chipping do, away every weekend. Can't and then, do that anymore. Yeah, a little piggy bank. <laughs> <laughs> do you still have the car? No, I, I, I traded it in. I, I kept that car about 10 years. So, yeah, 2014, mm -hmm. 2015, I think I turned that car in. It was just starting to be, I wish I would have kept it. Of course, I love older cars now. I got a several. I got a couple of them. And it's one that I wish I would have kept because I kept it real presidential and clean. I never put, like, wheels or anything on it. But, the you know, that that advance in technology from 04 to to 2014 was enough to make go like eh, in this kind of car I kind of want the newer shit I don't know so tell don't us know. how bad you ate it on the trade in <laughs> you know what I didn't eat it that bad to really be good Rolls Royces actually do well and the more you keep it fairly original they do they do even better so. For me, I think I actually considered it a win, man. I because I ended up drawing, getting like a Bentley, but I I I think they gave me maybe one sixty for it. But you paid four twenty for it. Yeah, right? but I drove it for ten years. All right, I'm just I saying they it. drop. I drove it for ten years, but ten years at that, and then yeah. to get one sixty, and then the, you got your value. Yeah, and the next car was like. The next car I got was like a Bentley for like two thirty, so that knocked off hype. That that I ended up getting a Bentley for under a hundred. You know, like that's a win. Yeah, yeah, it's sure. a win in car life. You right. know, what I mean, that's that's. You but know. you should have bought a fish tank. Then, those things will yeah. double in value yeah. in that time <laughs> period. Like, all the dinners you could have. But I like, he's got like sharks in the Oh, the Branzino? Like, yeah, I got Branzino. Like. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Earn your feet. You yeah. I was not going to have this big old fish tank and not necessarily. I had to learn to be out like those Seattle dudes were just <laughs> yeah. throwing Tossing it across the, the room. Pike Pike. Yeah. I yeah, teach myself oh, how to man. catch a big fish. What the hell are those guys called? They're called the mongers. Mongers. Yeah. yeah. You could hire yeah. your own monger. Mongers at home, man. Yeah. <laughs> That's what Tracy should do. I've got a picture. Hire a monger. Too. Get just it's usually a white dude in bib overalls yeah, that bibs, are orange the and then you pull it out and then you throw it to another guy. You gotta have overalls. some kind of cool saying. Hello. Right. You, you toss it. And it's then a they performance. Toss it. Yeah. And they yeah. throw it pretty far. Like these guys are, you know, they're not. They're not like messing around. I've seen them like toss one really uh, far across the room. It's oh, not like a. They're good. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah like that fish is flying, man. Precise. Um, how, how often are you going out golfing? Uh, usually a couple of times a month now. I don't. I, I, I used to go like you know at least every week. You know, but 
But now, uh, you know, it's just life just picks up. You know, right. like, I don't know. I've been, I've been watching DJ Khaled get in a golf. Have you been seeing this? Uh, yeah, I played in this tournament, so I've seen him. It's yeah, like, what do you think? No. No? Oh, oh good. No, no. Good. Khaled is, a, <laughs> Khaled is a master marketer, man. He does nothing I, well. I wake up thinking about, like, what would DJ Khaled do in this, mo- this situation? Like, this would be, like... <laughs> He just knows how to market, man. He's like the best at it. Well, wow. have you seen him play it. Bob Marley's guitar? <laughs> uh, oh, no. <laughs> no. Did they let him do that for real? He yeah. let himself he, do it. He, oh, he's no. a good marketer. All right, let's go Don't out on a up. high note of hating <laughs> DJ Khaled. Oh. I always worry I'm going to run into someone who likes him, and then I'm going to have to act like man. I like him. He's the best. I we love the DJ best. Khaled, man. <laughs> Yeah. Meme Gods is the doc, and you can look for that coming out soon. Yeah, man. And then also the novel, Flipping Boxcars, that's available wherever you buy books. And you can go online and go to IamCedric.com, probably find out dates and projects yeah, and everything. all kinds of stuff. Everything there. All yeah. right. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Cedric, for joining in. Yeah, I'm going to be in the Sacramento Punchline November 17th, 18th, but there, I think those shows are going to sell out, so you got to go now. Fargo, North Carolina, or North Dakota, I should say. Be at a theater over there. Just go to amcrawl.com for all my shows. Mike Fanoia, Don't Let Me Down is the name of his stand-up special, coming out next or this Thursday. And until next time, Adam Crow for Mike Fanoia and Cedric the Entertainer, Chris Max Pass, saying mahalo. Mahalo.